We have a, a wonderful uh, and very interesting program for, uh, for us today, and it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Guillermo Rodriguez Marin, Martin, who is director of the Casa de la India, or India, <laughs> India, in Valladolid, the uh, Indian Cultural Center in Spain, uh, since its foundation in 2003 by the University of Valladolid, the City Council of Valladolid, and the Government of India. Uh, Dr. Guillermo Hermetin is a holds a PhD from the University of Valladolid and from the University of Kerala, where he researched contemporary Indian poetry in English and submitted a dissertation on A.K. Ramanujan's aesthetics and poetics, about which we will hear more uh, this afternoon. He studied for seven years research period at the Loyola College in Madras, the Chennai now, and the University of Kerala in Trivandrum and now Tiruvananthapuram <laughs> in the 1990s. He has returned to the University of Valladolid, where he held the post of Indian Studies Coordinator at the Center for Asian Studies at the University of Valladolid from 2002 and 2003. He has lectured extensively on contemporary Indian literature, Indian aesthetics, bhakti literature, performing arts traditions in India, and literary criticism. He's a man for all seasons, right? And uh, he's a multidisciplinary scholar, translator, cultural manager, producer, writer, who has published in India, Spain, France, Poland, and Germany expert in Indian culture, advisor to various institutions in India and Europe. <coughs> uh, Guillermo is a board member of the Spain India Foundation Council, board member of the Euro India Center in La Rochelle, France, and member of the advisory council of the India Europe Foundation for New Dialogues in Lausanne and Paris. He is also co-founder of the Spain India Smart Heritage Think Tank, Excellent. Uh, set up with the Indian National Trust for Art and Cultural Heritage in New Delhi. Uh, he received in 2010 the Gonzalez Sinde Award from the Spanish Academy of Cinematographic Arts and Sciences, and in 2012 he was awarded the Friendship Award by the Minister of External Affairs, Government of India, Government of India for his contribution to Indo-Spanish cultural relations. His recent book, When Mirrors Are Windows, a view of A.K. Ramanujan's poetics, was published by Oxford University Press in June 2016. So he's covered a great deal of ground. He's become very fascinated with the life and works of our dear friend and colleague, uh, Professor Ramanujan, who was taken from us very, very sadly and very, very soon, uh, unfortunately. So uh, with that, let me uh, turn the, uh, the podium, as it were, over to Prof uh, Dr. Guillermo uh, Rodriguez, uh, who will speak to us today on mirrors and windows on A.K. Ramanujan's Poetics. Talk will be followed, and we will introduce this separately by a, a, an additional delight for us, a dance based on Ramanujan's poetry by uh, Dr. Uh, Rodriguez's partner, Monica de la Fuente. Please. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Goldman. I'm so thrilled to be here. And I would first of all like to thank the entire team that has made this possible, headed by uh, Professor Goldman, and um, it is obviously um, not easy to speak at a place which uh, had the man himself. <laughs> Eko Ramanujan was uh, known to travel to a number of universities. I, I'm very um, sure that uh, both the University of Chicago and the U University of California were very, very dear to him. And I know that because I've been able to go through a lot of his um, documents. This entire um, study was uh, mainly based on my research on the Eka Ramanujan papers, which are at the University of Chicago. Uh, so I'm, it's, it's an honor for me to be here, and I'm very grateful for the Institute for having organized this. Um, I would like to start with introducing the, the man. And um, as many of you know, uh, he became, uh, you know, quite uh, well known as a translator, as an anthropologist, as a folklorist, as a linguist, as a poet in his own right. A uh, poet in two languages, a poet in English and a poet in Canada. In fact, he's taught in India um, in master's programs as an Indian poet writing in English. I had the privilege of attending the early college in Chennai where, you know, the way I got introduced to Robert Jones as a poet. Um, so, as a multidisciplinary scholar, artist, linguist, and um, 
uh, poet, we have to look at his, I, my, I attempted in this book to look at how his aesthetics was forged, molded in his first 30 years in India, of which not many people uh, know about because um, it is a period where unless we read his essays where he talks about it and there are certain metaphors which kept, keep circulating in his life, uh, we, we, we would probably not uh, find um, the nuances that uh, you know we need to know about him to understand why uh, he had uh, this particular outlook and vision and uh, kind of transformative idea of what Indian literature as a whole and Indian uh, you know scholarship was. Yes. Sorry. Yes. So we need to know uh, his third, fir first 30 years were so crucial to his way, the way he looked at, at India and the world. And um, you know, um, I don't know how many of you are um, have read any of his works, but um, let me just give you an outline in the chronological order. Ramanujan was uh, born in Mysore, present-day Karnataka. Uh, he was a Tamil Brahmin. Uh, whose parents were from the Chennai area, Madras area. And both his mother and father were Vaishnava uh, Brahmins. The um, metaphor of the house uh, was very important in his work. Um, it was a metaphor that stood for the multilingual and multicultural background. He was, as a Tamil Brahmin, familiar with the Tamil language, but his first uh, literary language was Kannada. So he was living in a Kannada area, Kannada speaking area in present day Karnataka, Mysore. Um, but he was able to absorb the Tamil culture through his parents. His father uh, was a mathematician. And um, he used to joke that, you know, he, w he was, his father was both an astronomer and uh, an astrologer. So to him, science and uh, uh, other disciplines were not uh, a paradox, and uh, he, you know he had this. Um, he was nurtured in both the scientific and the traditional Indian uh, milieu, and this is important because he used to say that you know he he was able to absorb all the oral traditions in the kitchen where his grandmother and aunts and used to visit and his mother. So he he was exposed to the oral tradition from a very young age. At the same time, on the street, uh, of, on the streets of Maestro, he, he became immediately, and he went to college and school. He went to a um, um, uh, Montessori school that was already in Montessori kindergarten, which was very important also. And he was immediately um, reading everything he could find: uh, encyclopedias, books, novels. His father's attic was well, uh, uh, you know, well established as as a as a both uh, Western and kind of in West, steep in Western and Eastern wisdom, you could find he could find all the Romantics, the British uh, literature. He was exposed to uh, uh, philosophy. He would be able to absorb uh, all the you know the Western tradition at the time as well as the Sanskrit uh, works that his father uh, used to used to store at home. So, if you want, the metaphor of the house was important because it had it had these three layers, and he used to say that in the attic. Uh, he would just, uh, you know, uh, absorb, you know, if you want the great traditions and in the kitchen and out, s out in the street. We'll come to that metaphor later, which Milton Singer uh, used, the little traditions, mm -hmm. and which uh, he then later transformed. He used the, those traditions to explain his own idea of Indian literature. So the house became a container of his own uh, multidisciplinary, sorry, multilingual and uh, multitraditional background. And um, he was also a person that um, was very interested. He was very interested in magic tricks. He used to uh, get this uh, the magic kits and uh, you know perform uh, to f for friends for the public. And uh, this later show you know showed also in his in his poems, which were like Chinese boxes and kind of uh, magic objects. And he was also uh, you know. Um, his father wanted to be a mathematician, 
but he was not very happy with that. Uh, his marks were not too bad in, in mathematics, but uh, slowly he figured that he was more drawn to literature. And uh, you may not know that he's, his name, uh, he was named Ramanujan because his father was a close friend of Srinivas Ramanujan, the mathematician. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it coincided in 1911, they went, uh, you know, uh, Ramanujan, Srinivas Ramanujan had already become uh, an important figure. Uh, he, when he came back from Cambridge, uh, he was at Pachayapa's college for some time where later uh, his father, uh, A.K. Ramanujan's father taught. So he was so um, impressed by Ramanujan, the mathematician, that his father named his second son after Ramanujan, the mathematician. So this penchant, both for science and for um, uh, wisdom traditions and oral traditions and literature and poetry, uh, this double layer in him became very crucial later on. Um, in 1946, he, um, an, at the age of 16, renounced the Brahmin tradition. He threw away his sacred thread. So the rebellion in him um, became at a crucial time. I mean, we're talking about a period where, um, you know, not only 1947, India became independent, but it was also a, f a political turmoil in the Dravidian um, Tamil and Kannada nationalist movements. And he showed his... Um, you know, his rebellion in, in, in many ways, but this was one way of sh trying to shun tradition. And where did he find um, another source, or an alternative source? Uh, a, a teacher in 1947 introduced him to the Bhakti uh, Bachanas. The Bachanas are the saints. It's a mystic tradition, medieval mystic tradition, which he later presented as a counter or anti- tradition to the hegemonical, uh, you know, uh, case system or the literary traditions uh, that were, that preceded it. The bhakti tradition of the uh, Lingaya communities, which were Shiva worshippers, were in many ways, uh, perhaps he highlighted or foregrounded that aspect, uh, 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 a counter tradition and were very revolutionary in many ways, Basavana, Dasimaya, Akka Mahadevi, all these authors. So he found in them uh, exactly the, those qualities that he wanted to find um, and that were, became um, another source of inspiration which showed him a way uh, within his own tradition to become uh, you know, a poet of sayings. He wanted his um, poetry to be as, you know, speech, as a conversation, and the oral qualities of those poetries helped him to achieve that. Not only the Western modernists, you know, he's always classified as a modernist, um, and we always tend to compare him with William Carlos Williams, with Pound, and with all the other, uh, you know, modernists of the, of the Western tradition. But this discovery of the Vachanas at the age of 47 was very crucial. Um, he was then drawn to uh, the folk, what we call folk studies, at a time when it was absolutely uncommon to go around uh, the villages and collect tales, uh, record them, and so on. Um, after moving, um, you know, after he finished his college in, in English, he studied English literature, became a professor of English, and he, he was posted to different parts of India. But the, sh the years from 1952 to 1958 in Belgaum uh, became his, um, you know, important, it was part of his discovery of, of folk tales and folk traditions where he was able to uh, learn that the oral aesthetics that, uh, you know, you find in those little traditions were so rich and he was not able to do it in a rigorous manner as we might have uh, you know, as he did later when he was in, in Chicago and, and the, uh, you know, in, in America, at American universities. But he would, he would also already start his note cards, which you find in his, in his papers, where he would try to uh, compare, you know, the different uh, motives and try to compare it with, you know, all the resources he had available at the time. So he became, he, he, he became kind of a, his own, you know, uh, master in analyzing these poems and later on brought in psychoanalysis. So this is his phase in Belgium where he studied uh, folklore and he was able to record hundreds of tales and uh, you know, look at them from a structuralist point of view. 
Then um, he uh, was drawn to linguistics, and he, uh, you know, that was another way of going back to his, the science and the scientific angle in him. He wanted, uh, you know, he needed that kind of uh, uh, scientific approach, uh, and in linguistics, which is the science of language, and in Saussure, he found uh, that he could put uh, his uh, other the other part of his brain to use. He first started writing, scribbling poetry in Kannada. Uh, there are no um, texts in English, there's no English poetry uh, before 1946, but there are some texts in the papers already in Kannada from 1945. And he was also writing radio plays. Hmm? Radio plays, in fact, I brought a little radio piece, a vintage radio, uh, which, uh, will remind us of that, uh, which I will use, we will use in the performance. So he was very, very enthusiastic about performance. You know, radio plays were a way of, sh you know, uh, mm, performing uh, a story. Mm? A story was not something static, a story had its life. And he used to write these radio plays and his uh, teachers at the college used to perform them. And he mm -hmm. produced 25 radio plays for all in their radio at the time, when he was just 16 or 17. So English poetry, he started to scribble around the age of 18. So that little later, 1947. And it more or less coincided with the period when he discovered the Vachalas, the Bhakti Saints. So he has a series of poems, which he calls, not exactly translations, he calls them after, you know, after mm -hmm. Mahadevika, after mm -hmm. Basana, inspired by. And there's again a conflation of his own poetry with what he thought of as translations. And this is interesting because he always wanted to be part of the tradition. He wanted to inscribe his own work in the tradition of the both the Tamil Sangam tradition and the, in the rich uh, you know, South Indian Bhakti tradition. I mean, we come to that later. So his identification with his poets was very strong. Uh, he wanted to feel as if the poet, you know, for him, um, the poet had to become uh, in some way possessed by those uh, authors that, not authors, but because they were mystics who didn't write in the way we think about it, but, but, but by the, the, he, he used to say, and I read, I'll phrase, um, I'll read a phrase from him that is um, kind of a summary of what, what he thought about uh, translating. He said, tra as, tr as a translator, one translates to repossess one's past not only to realize the pastness of the past, but the presence of the past. In this business of translating and retranslating from one tradition to another, funny things happen. You know? And we'll see some of those funny things that, that happened and that happened to him. So his first 30 years end with a crucial uh, mm, mm, journey, and that is uh, he was able to get a Fulbright scholarship. In 1959, uh, after, you know, he had been studying linguistics in Pune. He got the scholarship to continue his linguistics at Indiana University of Bloomington. Mm -hmm. So he boarded a ship, which took him on a journey to Aden, Marseille, the site of the Paris, ended up in, and went all the way to New York. And there's a diary that he wrote on the ship, mm -hmm. which I have, I've also mentioned in my book. So that's his first 30 years in a, in a nutshell. And what happened after that, is perhaps better known and his discovery at the University of Chicago in 1962 of the um, uh, some manuscripts of the classical Tamil Sangam period, which is, which is another of his important uh, you know, sources of inspiration. Um, as you know, uh, he translated a number of works uh, of that became mm, classics in their own right. So I just want to show you some of the books so that we relate the different kinds of, also chronologically. So he's, in, in, in 1959, he, he joins Indian, uh, Indian he, and he has, a, in, he does creative writing workshops, and he had a professor there, Samuel Yellen, uh, who used to kind of write notes on his poems, but he would completely ignore those corrections. <laughs> he would publish the poems almost as he would <laughs> submit them to the professor, and there's an example of that there. Um, <coughs> so he was in the early 60s working on a poetry collection called The Striders, uh, which he published in 1966. This is the 50th year uh, of 
uh, you know, 50th anniversary of the publication of this work. And most of these poems uh, he were written, uh, you know, around those crucial years, 1960, 61. Some were written before he came to India, uh, he, before he came to the U.S. And this was his, you know, imagistic period, if you want. Uh, but you will. This was before he discovered the Sangam uh, classics, and um, then, of course, a little later, a few years later, he brought out um, another collection, of Relations. But this book, speaking of Shiva, some of you may may know, uh, this is the result of this this engagement with the Bhakti tradition of the of the medieval period of the Kannada speaking region, and. Um, this book became a cult book at the time, and you may not know that it also influenced one of the most important um, English poets of the time and even today, that is Ted Hughes. Mm -hmm. Ted Hughes. And uh, this has become a new line of kind of uh, a, a new area of uh, study of Ted Hughes' works. And um, my PhD guide, whose wife is um, kind of a scholar, pointed this out at, su and at some conference uh, about 15 years ago. And now there are these comparative studies where there's, there's a period in Ted Hughes' life which was influenced by the Vachanas. <laughs> I mean, they don't belong to anyone, but they were introduced to him through this work, speaking of Shiva. Another interesting anecdote. Um, later, we now, it's now uh, 62, he joined as an associate professor of Dravidian studies in, um, at the University of Chicago. Now, why is, there was an essay on Ramanujan written not many years ago titled, The Importance of Being a Ramanujan. So why would, uh, why are we now still talking about the scholar and the multiple disciplinary uh, figure he was? You know, there are many ways of replying to that question, but to some extent, and you will probably agree with me, he was very crucial in putting Dravidian studies on the map in the US at a time when most of the studies were looking at Sanskrit uh, literature and the Vedic tradition. And of course he did not achieve this completely alone, but he was crucial in uh, um, you know, bringing an important corpus of work, of literature, to the West, to Western audience in a way that they could enjoy it. Because these translations are, you know, like works of art. They're like new poems, um, you know, but at the same time, uh, very, very faithful to the original. Of course, there was some controversy afterwards that he is, you know, uh, some people said he wrote uh, the Vachanas as, you know, as if Akamadi kind of read like Sylvia Plath, uh, Shiva Prakash said in, uh, uh, you know, the Lingayat uh, um, critics, and there was, some, there was some controversy about the way he presented it, but he always said, I'm not translating text, but I'm translating the reader. So his effort of translating the reader um, is reflected in the way he took so much care in the introductions, afterward, forward, became crucial text to understand <coughs> you know, the body of what he was translating. And, and, and cost to contextualizing these texts was important to him. Not only did he bring those, you know, unknown traditions to Western audiences, but also to a lot of Indian audiences. And there's a whole generation of uh, even dancers who were started to base their, some of their works and got inspiration, uh, you know, by his translations of the Sangam tradition. Uh, so a lot of uh, mm, uh, you know scholars and general readers in India were able to access this, these texts through his translations, and he has you know spawned a whole generation of, of translators. A lot of his students and colleagues were deeply inspired and influenced by his work. So uh, uh, following the chronological uh, introduction, uh, there is of course an important point in his life. And um, he did not have an easy uh, or marriage with his wife, Molly Daniels. I think there's plenty of that has been also written about because it's there in his poem. So he mm -hmm. married and divorced twice. Mm -hmm. uh, he went through an important personal crisis in, in 71 after his first divorce. <coughs> and he even experimented with, uh, to some extent, limited extent, with um, 
uh, masculine uh, the way Huxley had done 20 years before, and that's also the end of diaries. We've also built that into the performance. Uh, and that's crucial because uh, some of the poems that he scribbled after that experience mm, came or became a part of uh, another collection he published in 1986. So a lot of the students of his Indian poetry in English were surprised that after he published 1973, he published um, um, uh, Speaking of Shiva, he had already published his second collection Relations of his own poetry in 71, but between that and 1986 there was a long silence in his own uh, Indian poetry in English. He did not publish anything. He did publish and he is his third love affair that's with the Alvars, Namalva, the, the Tamil Bhakti tradition which precedes the uh, Vachana tradition of, uh, uh, of the Kannada speaking region. Um, in the late 70s, he got immersed, and I say immersed because the title he chose is Hymns for the Drowning, this play, you know, with uh, the, the idea of drowning. Alvar is to immerse yourself, Alvar mm -hmm. in Tamil. Poems by, uh, for Vishnu by Namarvar. So he went back to the Vaishnava tradition that he knew so well. Mm -hmm. And in between, he came up with a collection he never published, which was titled The Soma Poems. Soma, as you know, is the uh, Vedic god, the elixir of uh, uh, the gods, the, you know, inspiration. It can mean many things. Um, it is also a drug, if you want. And uh, there are many interpretations of what Soma, at the time, uh, even when the Doniger wrote an essay in the early 90s, whether Soma was a mushroom, so this old debate was going on as to what Soma really was. So he was interested in this idea because for him Soma was inspiration. For him Soma was a metaphor. And um, Soma, of course, was also there in Aldous Huxley's work. So why did he not publish that body of work? He had about 50 or 60 poems that he called his Soma poems. Well, I have my own theory. I think it was self-censorship. Self he was embarrassed by uh, the possibility of uh, readers comparing him or this idea with uh, Aldous Huxley. And it was somehow embarrassing because they were very cheeky poems and very, um, you know, out of the box. It was very different kind of poetry. Uh, so he dropped that completely. He did not publish them. They're still there. There's, I'll read one, one of them later on, Jazz Poet for Soma. So Soma, he wa Soma was himself, Soma was the poet, for Soma was inspiration, it, it was a metaphor. But he thought people would maybe misinterpret that. And um, uh, after that, he brought out Second Sight, which is a collection of poems which also has an interesting history. And that is, he worked on a big composition that was about 24 poems long. I mean, it had 24 sections. And he called it composition. He, he, he started that work in 1982. And again, this is very crucial because Ramanujan is a bridge, yes. He's a translator of traditions of cultures, East, West. But let us also not forget the chronological bridge. He is, like many other scholars of his time, I mean, he was he came to the US when, you know, Jacobson and a lot of the linguists and well, everything that happened there, CBO of 1960, mm -hmm. 61, 62, early 60s, structuralism, you know, just flowering, and all these structuralist uh, anthropologists, Levi Strauss was everywhere. But then moving on into the 80s, this was challenged by the postmodern approach, you know. You know not only by Barth in 1968, you know, Kristeva and other thinkers, and Derrida. So there was a whole new, and you would probably know more about this, uh, uh, you know, challenge and intellectual uh, reassessment of a lot of the work, and he talks about that in his essays. But it, how did that affect his poetry? Of course it affected his poetry. A lot of his poetry, after this Soma group of poems, became very metapoetic. Metapoetic. And I'll come to that when I uh, discussed the title of the book, why I chose that title. Um, it became metapoetic, and interestingly, what he did in 1984, he took that long piece of 24 sections, and he chopped it in bits and pieces. You know, as if he wanted to say, no, but truth is in fragments, <coughs> you know? And 
he inserted or grafted into those poems all texts he had written in the 50s, old poems he had never published. He just threw them in there as if, you know, to, you know, state that he was trying to create his own tradition, his own, uh, his own body of work and a dialogue between these old texts. Uh, because that was crucial. He was very interested in reflexivity, reflection, you know, with his own work and all these traditions, because the way he explained Indian literature was as a network, if you want, of uh, different types of reflexivity. In that beautiful essay, uh, Where Mirrors of Windows, Where Mirrors of Windows, an anthology of reflections in Indian literature, which opens his collected essay, works were collected in 95, and the second essay is, is there in any way of thinking. He um, describes or identifies three types of reflexivity in, um, in Indian literature. One is um, where a text responds to another, that he calls co cortex. And the second category is where a text uh, reflects on another, reacts, and that he would call countertext. Uh, m most counter text. And the third category is those texts which, which you know, speak about themselves, which he called uh, the, you know, the meta text, mm? the text that speaks about itself. It's not that there are these categories, but you have these qualities in a different way. Of course, you could say this of many other traditions, not only the Indian tradition. You have a, le a lot of self-reflexivity -re in, in Don Quixote, for example. Mm. But these are qualities he used to try and build a different a paradigm or a different um, set of tools or a meta language uh, along with this idea of context sensitivity to counter the whole idea of the categories of little traditions and the great tradition. He was constantly trying to find a way. So intertextuality was crucial for him as an idea and he played with, with that concept and it, it, it went quite well with the post-modern or post-structuralist ideas. In fact, many of you know, uh, must know that Derrida has been interpreted from the Indian perspective also. There are a lot of essays around that. So there's a lot of Derrida in his last poetry collection, 1986, called Second Sight, which is quite metaphysical in, to some extent and very metapoetic. There's a lot of metapoetry. And a lot of the poems reflect on earlier poems even and so on. And then, and I end this uh, little introduction and uh, talk uh, by mentioning what happened when, he, you know, what we found or what was found after he passed away. Because his last uh, collection in life, in his, during his lifetime was Second Sight, 1986, um, where there are, you'll find, if you are careful enough, you will be able to trace which poems were part of that big collection of 20, 22, 24 pieces because they're couplets and they're clinched, like the kural, the Tamil kural. Mm. The way he links one couplet with another and so on is the same, you, you, he's using the same metrical structure, but they're just interspersed. And in between, he ha he's throwing in some really old poems he, he didn't publish in the 50s and 60s, and that whole thing becomes like a mosaic. So he left a body of work behind, um, which is later published and collected in 95, in uh, uncollected poems, and there's another collection which became part of collected poems, which is also uh, it was titled The Black Hand by the editors, but he didn't have that title in mind, where the poetry becomes uh, also quite in, you know, involved in, it becomes more obscure, because he suffered a lot of pain. He was um, having, a, 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 you know, uh, for a number of years, problems with his spine, with his bones, and, and uh, that's the reason also he, he you know, he unfortunately uh, hospitalized uh, for a normal surgery, but uh, the anesthetics was not the right one and he passed away in 93. Uh, those latter years, um, he, both the pain, physical pain, um, you know, and the fact that he divorced again in 1988, you know, m make these poems m obscure, painful, and also more obsessed with uh, you know, fears that were, had already been there throughout his life. Fears as a writer, you know, what if I cannot write the next poem? The, that existential fear of, of the poet. But uh, there's so much beautiful prose in his diaries of those years where he talks about the act of 
creation, the act of writing. So what I've tried to do in, in, his, um, in this analysis is to, to trace um, his uh, life using poetry as the metaphor and as the central axis of his scholarship. To me, his work as a linguist, as a translator, as an anthropologist, and um, as a scholar of so many different disciplines converge or flow into his poetics. And this is what I try to do. Uh, and what we will see uh, in a short while is, a, um, is an interpretation, a performance of his poetics, uh, which uh, we will do for the first time. We've done bits and pieces, and it's a homage to Ramanujan as somebody who believed that poetry is performance and that poetry has to be experienced, poetry has to be embodied and therefore I have asked Monica to join me in that performance. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, Guillermo, uh, you know, your very interesting presentation about Raman's life reminds us in a way how much we lost when uh, when we suffered that terrible loss. He, uh, Raman had been here in Berkeley just, uh, as I mentioned to you, a few days before he passed away, and he seemed fine, and then when we heard the news, we were just deeply shocked. But, you know, one of the things I remember about him was the, the suppleness of his mind and the way he thought about so many different things and brought them in. So you brought in some of the, some of the issues he had mentioned, you know, about the structure of his house. Mm -hmm. But what was interesting also was the way he, he structured language around genders as well as sort of social levels. So he had this interesting uh, idea of father languages yes. and mother languages, yes, you yes, see? Yes. So he would go up the top floor yes. of the house was where Papa was, right? The, the Jyotisha, yes, the yes. Sanskrit speaker. Yes. Sanskrit and English for him became the father languages. And then in the middle realm, you had Tamil, which was his mother language. But then you, he learned Kannada. This was the language of the, what they call domestic helps. Yes, in, yes. In India, right? Because these were the local women in Mysore who were you know, running the household uh, for this Brahmin household. So you had this kind of very clear sense of social hierarchies, gendered hierarchies, you know. Uh, and he brought those into, into many uh, contexts of his work of his life. Uh, you mentioned, I think, briefly, he had some interest uh, that he worked on with me on psychoanalytic mm -hmm. uh, studies. He wrote that very interesting article on the Indian Oedipus, yes. right? And uh, on, on modes of discourse, this are there Indian way of thinking? Is there an Indian way of thinking? Is there an Indian way of thinking? Again, the playing, yeah, playing, playing with, the way, with, it. with the way you pronounce the phrase. Exactly, yeah. exactly, exactly. Really so, and um, is. I wonder in the kind of, you know, penumbra, uh, afterlife of Ramanujan's work, how interestingly, and how I suppose it would have amused him, how he became a controversial figure uh, with that long ago essay on the Ramayana, which ah, he and yes. I have talked about yes, for yes. many years. Because he, he came from this, as you said, the Sri Vaishnava tradition, mm -hmm. the Tamil Sri Vaishnava tradition, which is very heavily invested in Valmiki and its text. Mm -hmm. uh, and we had long talks about that, he, you know, because for that tradition, Valmiki is the most central text, and the Sundarakanda oh. is the most central you know, moment of that uh, uh, text. Uh, in fact, he told me that uh, at the time of his father's death, uh, his father had been doing a, uh, what they call a Ramayana Parayana, which was a, a recitation of the Ramayana, you know, and he was working through the Sundarakanda, and then he was called away uh, by some business, and he left, and then he too died relatively young. Mm -hmm. And Raman's mother always blamed that on Sundarakanda, <laughs> because you didn't finish that mm. part of mm. Sundarakanda that would cause your death, you know. It would be very serious. The father was very much into that. But that essay, as some of you may know, just reprinted, became a, a kind of cause celebre and a source of scandal at the Delhi University a number of years ago when it was put in an anthology of, uh, of history and also for Oxford University Press, you know, mm -hmm. the book was banned and recalled, and a kind of international incident grew out of it, you know, it was quite, uh, I'm sure he would have been it's still very going, amused yeah, by it's it. <laughs> Somehow still going on. <laughs> still going on, yes. yeah, with other works yeah, and, and so on and so forth, but that was one of the first, yeah. you know, because yes, then it was, was, it people was, had yeah. attacked the history department at yeah. uh, DU and then Oxford University Press withdrew the book and so on. 
Let's open the floor up yes, to some comments, yeah. observations, questions about uh, the many, the many wonderful things that uh, Raman has left us, and the yes. Shaiva poetry, the Alvar poetry, uh, so on and so forth. We have some of our South Indian students here. Let me just actually follow up what you were saying about the essay and ask you what you think of uh, how he's read in India today as a poet. Uh, you were saying that the first time you encountered him was in uh, Loyola in Madras as a as a poet of uh, as an English poet. Um, yeah, it's this. This is quite interesting. I actually first uh, came across uh, you know on one of my overland trips to India, which was not that long ago, but already early nineties uh, in Benares. Uh, I bought several books. Um, there's a Spanish bookstore, in fact, in Benares, and Godolia. Yeah. And um, one of them was 10 Indian English poets. So, um, edited by Bharta Sarathi, who was another uh, poet in his own right. And it was very interesting to, you know, seek through the text and the poems, and I was immediately struck by the magic quality of, of Ramanujan's work. I mean, he had this uh, uh, this genius uh, whereby he could write a poem that uh, in such a way that it made you it made you reread it again. I don't know if you've read a poem like Snakes, which has this cyclical circles. It makes you read the poem again, and I could immediately sense that there are different layers in the, in the poem. So I left it there, and um, and then I bumped into speaking of Shiva, and uh, after you know, traveling and spending some time. This was my gap year after after college. I spent college in Spain, and I had just been studying linguistics at Edinburgh University, stylistics. Mm -hmm. uh, I, my wife Monica joined Kalakshetra in China. And um, I was, you know, so immersed in reading, reading, and uh, tried to know more about it. So I joined an MA program, Loyola College, where, he, you know, Indian English poetry was taught. And they use you know, uh, this anthology and a num number of other anthologies, uh, and all the anthologies of those of the 70s and 80s have Ramanujan's poems. So he is known in India as a as a translator and as as mainly through Penguin and Oxford University Press. I mean his books, but at English departments he's then he's taught, uh, and um, so is Nisim Ezekiel, A.K. Merotra, mm -hmm. and other poets, of course. But he's he's known for that and. Um, but they don't present him as, as a multidisciplinary scholar. I mean, they don't tell you, you know, read his essays also. I only found out much later, uh, this was in 95, and his collected essays came out yeah, after that, that he had written. So I came across one, po uh, one essay, another essay. Uh, now it's probably changing, and depend it depends on which department you go to. And after this essay, you know, this is one of those funny things that something becomes controversial, everybody starts talking about Ikram Ramanujan again, you know? And um, I don't know if that has anything to do with why I, I have now I've published the book, but certainly uh, they, they were very keen to do something on Ramanujan. And, and this, is, uh, this, is a text, this is a book that is aimed at or uh, you know, will help those uh, scholars and students that are interested in his work as an Indian poet understand uh, you know, where this, all this came from. And it's not, you know, you can use it as a reference book. You can see, you know, Ramanujan and linguistics. So you go to that page, Ramanujan mm -hmm. and structuralism, or post-structuralism, or Ramanujan and pragmatism. And so I try to bring in kind of a system of analyzing it, which comes from my German background, because I grew up in Germany. So exactly. somebody said to me, Jason Gruno said to me, this cannot be written by, this is not a Spaniard. <laughs> this is the German in you. <laughs> because it's, 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 it's got this systematic, uh, you know, approach. So uh, it you know, kind of brings everything in there, and you, you, but always with the poetics and aesthetics in the background. Another beautiful metaphor, and um, I want to give you is, he he believed or he saw you know for him a poem, you know, it's like it has to resonate. So in the same manner as when you play the sitar, play the string, you have the resonating strings. So it has to resonate with all that tradition and all the past, present and future <laughs> uh, poets that, you know, that have been part of your life and it has to resonate with, your, with all that in, the back, in your background. The poem is that. It, ha it just has to be, it's part of this larger system. 
And I think that's a beautiful metaphor. It was also part of a performative thing for him. He yes. had a beautiful way of reading his poetry, almost yes. inimitable way of reading yes. his poetry. Yeah, I cannot like do that. I cannot no, do that. It it's very impossible. Difficult. Yeah. And his very low voice, exactly. which is yeah. sometimes shriek, and there are some yeah, yeah, recording yeah, of The way he read these things is very striking, very striking. Mm -hmm. so sorry. sorry that I get so passionate about no, no, no. I don't know if, you <laughs> if I answered your question. No, you did, so <laughs> I just I wanted to. No, I, I let. Um, Chrissy yeah. ask, but um, just wondering if you saw any parallels between the way, since you brought up the other AK, um, Adam Krishna Mehrotra's translations of Kabir yeah. uh, that he did recently. Yes, yes. And, and, and Bhartha Sarathi also did. Uh, right. Y you might know that he was, um, he brought this rigor to translation uh, and workshop and translation, and he was involved in with Hyderabad CFL mm -hmm. in a number mm -hmm. of translation workshops. Mm -hmm. So this is another thing we should thank him for, that he not only convinced or try to in, in, you know, instill the love for tradition in contemporary poetry. He used to write in this amazing in part, said, do tr please translate, just so well and others. You must translate. You know, you can't just write in an empty, you know, or in a British tradition. You have to write in your own tradition. You have to insert your work in this larger tradition. Mm -hmm. And he did that also from the academic point of view, you know, uh, by starting all these workshops, translation workshops, and uh, which is now very crucial, and we are going to have a whole section on translation next to the Literature Festival, because that's, that's, that's a crucial uh, discipline. Yeah. Chrissy, yeah. Yeah, um, I have a quick question. Um, if you could speak a little bit more Well, he used his, obviously he used his linguistics to, to teach uh, Tamil and, uh, you know, he, he was a teacher of Dominican studies. But if, but his, li you know, ling the linguistics um, grid, you know, so soon, the communication gra uh, diagram, you know, where you have, uh, uh, you know, the receiver and the speaker or the artist, receiver, the co you know, the communication diagram, you know, the medium and the, uh, he used that and he, pl he applied it to many other uh, disciplines. So for him, uh, I don't think he would have written his essays the way, the way if he had not studied linguistics. So I would say linguistics is important uh, because it's the essence or the basis, the, the, the framework for structuralism, this, this mm -hmm. language, mm -hmm. linguistics. And uh, from he, was, he used a lot of linguistics uh, meta-language describing in his notes uh, tales or any anthropological topic. So it, it was like his grammar. I mean his own grammar. His med he derived a lot of meta language from linguistics. A lot. And that's also and he and that's also why the challenge from Derrida and others became so important, you know? Because uh, you know not only Bart said you know the text is death of the author but uh, difference, you know? Where the meaning where is the meaning? So the closeness of the or the, 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 the comfort that Saussure gave, you know, explaining the sign and the signified, and that he used all the time, mm -hmm. science, and he uses Saussure all the time, like many other structuralists. Mm -hmm. uh, but that comfort, it was just gone suddenly with, with all these post structures. And in his poetry also, I mean, of course he wrote in a way that he, he, he was, you could write like that without being a linguist, and if you could be a linguist, a very bad poet as well. He had that; he, tr he was able to tread the middle path. But a lot of his poems, I mean, I've, I've analyzed my entire MA dissertation, uh, which I submitted at um, Loyal College, was on a stylistic interpretation and thematic history of one single poem, Snakes. Mm -hmm. So I had a 50-page analysis of that one poem. Because he did not do it consciously, because for him it was something be between the conscious and unconscious, the, the ordinary mystery, he called it, how poems happen. You know, I leave that to later because you will see how poems happen. But you could immediately sense that this is written by somebody who has absolute control of the English language, and he's sometimes his poetry actually failed because it was too self conscious and too much of linguistics, you know? 
And, and of course, he applied linguistics also uh, to his work as a translator. Only a poet can translate another poem or another poet. But if you're a poet and a linguist as well, then uh, it, 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 has, it's a, it was a crucial tool. I think it's a, it's a very good question. I think linguistics is, 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 is the, the you know, groundwork or the framework which you use for many things. Yes, Hi, I'm most familiar with his folklore work, um, yes. in which he really liked to bring up the distinction of what he called the Agam and Purim. <coughs> yes, yes. Classification of genres, which of course was very gendered, the Agam inside mm -hmm. the female sphere and the Purim outside male sphere. And I'm mm -hmm. not so much familiar with, with his other work, and I'm curious, mm -hmm. since he highlighted it so much in his folklore writings, if, if, this, um, if this dichotomy comes into play in any of his other work, the Agam and Purim? Yeah, in Purim. fact, my, my, my book is based on that. It's oh. inner and outer. <laughs> yeah. if, if you, you know, wha how do I use those metaphors? Yeah. I mean, um, that again, uh, you know, of course you can't compare it with his self-reflexive, but for him, uh, even uh, this essay, where Marissa uh, mm -hmm. our windows uses that, man, brings that together with reflexivity, because um, you can speak to yourself, and uh, or you s you respond to another. So the un the outward or inward movement. Of course, Akamapuram is also a genre of po the the theme. You know the theme, not only the direction of where the communication flow goes. Um, Ak Akam, briefly explain is the 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 more intimate. It's a poetry of love, and uh, it has the uh, it uses the. Um, you know, the in, he explains it in the interior landscape. It has this whole dichotomy, in this this whole grid of um, using uh, a meta language or language within a language, where certain words of the it's echo aesthetics, the landscape will give you the theme, whether it's a poem of uh, uh, you know of separation or a poem of intimate love or a poem of rejoinder. So. The the, the metaphors that are used, something that exists I also in the Japanese tradition, you know, where the landscape uh, is like inscape, is an inscape. The landscape will already provide the mood to a poem. Uh, so Akam and Puram is, you know, deals more with epic, with, with you know, what he calls war, you know, war called heroes, mm -hmm. you know, uh, like Murugan and so on. So uh, yes, that permeates his also his, his work because uh, for him. Uh, the Akam, and it's also there in his poems and his thematic uh, 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 the themes he uses when he talks about the, f the family relations and the family, but it's not two separate categories. This is very important. Uh, he writes about the family, he writes about himself, and he writes about uh, the inner circle, and then it's always connected to the outer world. He uses the uh, metaphor of the tree mm -hmm. uh, you know, to explain that with the, the upside down tree, with the roots in the air and the branches in the ground. So it is connected, and I read another phrase uh, mm -hmm. uh, that is connected to that. So yes, the, um, he was obsessed with his inner world, intimate world, and with not making certain things public. Mm -hmm. And that's why I wanted to use the, this, the title of the book also, because his diaries, which are self-reflexive, which are Akam, mm -hmm. you know, suddenly become windows because now we're able to read them. Uh, and they become, in that sense, you know, in that sense, mm -hmm. a topic of discussion. But uh, it, is, it is very much there. The Akam and Puram, along with the mother tongue and father tongue, uh, mm -hmm. this is part of his, mm -hmm. it's part of his meta language. Right. He used it and he applied it for, I think he was the first one to apply it in, in folk studies, if I'm not, if I'm not so. wrong. Yeah. yeah, and some of the, the you know, s some of the talk about with, with folklore is a little, even on a more simplistic level, you were saying some of the other genres are ones yes. that the grandmother would tell the children at yes, home yes. in the kitchen while cooking, for example. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting to see how this very complicated weaves it into his poetry. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah, exactly. Uh, I use this to explain his inner aesthetics, the inner poetics, actually, when he talks about himself, mm -hmm. and the outer aesthetics and the outer poetics, uh, it's when he talks and describes other traditions. But let me just read you a phrase that's maybe connected to this. Uh, in one of the talks, 1984, he said, Though I alone stand here, unconscious of the many people who are part of me, and the poets one has read, a gypsy proverb says, one can count all the oranges on a tree, but not all the trees in a single orange. 
I came to this country many years ago, almost by accident, and nearly drifted into staying on. In a way, one needs the other, even if it's the mocking other, to find oneself. The English language and America itself has been 